my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I am your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora, and I have the treat of having the first repeat guest on our show, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. Tom, how are you? Oh, I'm really well, thank you. And every time I hear the title of your show, I just laugh. I mean, it's such a perfect title, Beyond Your Wildest Genes, because uh, I think it sets the stage for everyone to re- realize or to suspect, wait a minute, so my genes don't control everything? No, no, they don't. No, they don't. They just mean you're vulnerable to different things. It's what you do in the environment around your genes, that's called the epigenome, that determines whether genes get turned on or turned off. So, Michael, I think your title is great for your show. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, (laughs) Tom is on our show today because he's written a book called The Autoimmune Fix. And I am really excited to get to the meat of this, uh, no pun intended. And uh, before I do that, let me read you Tom's bio. Dr. Tom O'Brien is a world expert on gluten and its impacts on your health. He is an internationally recognized and sought-after speaker and workshop leader specializing in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and the development of autoimmune diseases as they occur inside and outside of the intestines. He's the founder of thedoctor.com, that's www.thedr.com, and the visionary behind the Gluten Summit, a grain of truth, bringing together 29 of the world's experts on the gluten connection to diseases, disorders, and a wide range of symptoms and ages. You can find this info at theglutensummit.com. Dr. O'Brien is considered the Sherlock Holmes of chronic disease and metabolic disorders. He is a clinician par excellence in treating chronic disease and metabolic disorders from a functional medicine perspective. He holds teaching faculty positions with the Institute of Functional Medicine and the National University of Health Sciences. He has trained thousands of practitioners around the world in advancing understanding of the impact of food-related disorders and the development of individual autoimmune diseases. His 2016 critically acclaimed groundbreaking book, The Autoimmune Fix, outlines the step-by-step development of degenerative diseases and gives us the tools to identify our dis-ease process years before the symptoms are obvious. Dr. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm, I'm really excited. Could you, for the people, for the three or four people who don't know who you are, could you tell them about your journey, please? Uh, well, sure. Let's see. Uh, it started in 1979. My ex and I could not get pregnant. I, I was an intern at the time. I called the seven most famous doctors I'd ever heard of and said, what do you do for infertility? Uh, the most holistic doctors I'd ever heard of. They all told me what they do. I put a program together. We were pregnant in six weeks. My neighbors in married housing, uh, we lived on campus, uh, they heard about that, and they asked if I'd work with them, and I said, well, sure, I, sure, I don't know if it'll help, but why not? And they were pregnant in three months. So before I even got out of practice, we were hot to trot to help every couple get pregnant that wanted to get pregnant. And what we discovered in that process, and there's not much in medicine that's an all or every, but this was every, every woman or every couple that had imbalances in reproductive system function, whether it was infertility, recurrent miscarriages, endometriosis, estrogen deficiencies, estrogen excesses, progesterone deficiencies, every single one of them had foods that they were eating that they did not know their immune system was fighting. Mm -hmm. In other words, foods that were an irritant to them causing inflammation in their body that was contributing to the problems that they were having, every single one of them. And the most common food that people have a problem with is wheat. Most common in my clinical experience, wheat and dairy. Those are the two big kahunas. And we found that when people got wheat and dairy out of their diets within a very short period of time, sometimes days to a couple of weeks, they were feeling noticeably different. And the symptoms they've been putting up with for so long um, had started dissipating right away. 
So that got me into the whole world before I got out into practice to be considering foods and what's on the end of your fork as being contributing to your health or contributing to your disease. And over the last 30 some years, 35 years, it has turned out to be the case. And now there are so many thousands of studies on this, which is so great to see that when I'm on stage lecturing on this, I just keep pulling study after study after study after study. And the doctors sit there in awe because uh, in the medical education, um, there is very little to no emphasis on food. Mm. There's, there's none. I mean, when, when I was the president of the Chicago Chiropractic Society in 1989, we pushed through the legislation for the state of Illinois that for any physician to take the licensing exam to practice in the state, and that was medical doctors, osteopaths, and chiropractors, for anyone who applied, they had to have at least three courses in nutrition. Well, and we forced that through against the will of the medical profession at the time because most med schools don't have one course in nutrition. In 2010, 26% of the medical schools in our country met the minimum education requirements for diet nutrition training from the National Institute of Health. Wow. 20, 26% of them. In 2015, it was 22% of them. <laughs> it's getting worse, not better. Wow. That, that we've become so specialized looking at the many, many different pharmaceuticals that may be of value, the many, many different diagnoses that you can get that we have forgotten that the primary, the very primary uh, consideration for any chronic condition, when your car's not running very well, you might think that the gas you're using isn't very good. You know, you just want to check and see, am I using the right fuel in the gas tank? That it's a primary concern for any chronic condition. And if you think you can get away with having a little Coca-Cola once in a while, because it's not too bad, or you don't feel bad when you have it, but then you wonder why you wake up the next morning and your rheumatoid arthritis is acting up and it's hard to walk getting out of bed. You just don't put it together that something you put in your body yesterday has an effect on how your body functions today. So that uh, is kind of a roundabout way of <laughs> how, how I got into all of this. Awesome. So let's start talking about the autoimmune fix. Could you tell our audience what actually is autoimmune disease first? You bet. And it's uh, uh, part of my goal is that this becomes a more well-known concept uh, because uh, uh, it's not really profitable to know about this uh, from the commercial end of healthcare, and so there's no emphasis on it. The National Institute of Health tells us that nine people, nine million people a year are diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. 22 million people a year are diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. 24 million people a year are diagnosed with autoimmune diseases. It's the most common mm. of all. And we know that only one out of three people with an autoimmune disease is diagnosed. That means there are 72 million people out there walking around with card-carrying autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis or MS or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or lupus. Um, there's families, there's over 80 autoimmune diseases. It's when your immune system attacks self. And uh, we think, well, wait a minute, what, what do you mean by that? Well, when your immune system attacks your joints, if it continues to do that, you get arthritis mm -hmm. and your joints start to wear down. If it attacks your brain, you get Alzheimer's, mm. Parkinson's. If it attacks your heart, you get cardiomyopathy or cardiomyitis. Mm. Just depends on where um, your genetic vulnerabilities are that if you develop an autoimmune mechanism, where it's going to show itself. Gotcha. So as we learn more about autoimmune diseases, what uh, and the purpose of the book, The Autoimmune Fix, and the upcoming docu-series called Betrayal, the purpose of all this is to understand that you can identify this in advance, years in advance, and you can do something about it to arrest it. And the science says very clear, that's their language. You can arrest the development of autoimmune disease. And I'll give you the pearl right now. 
by healing the gut. Hmm. That we've all heard that the gut is often referred to as the second brain. Well, I actually think it's the first brain. Uh, more control comes out of the gut to our entire body than the control that comes out of our brain to the entire body. Uh, so autoimmunity is when your body attacks self, hmm. when it's attacking yourself. All right. So how does an autoimmune condition affect inflammation? When you pull at a chain, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It can be at one end, the middle, the other end, your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your genetic weak link is. That's where the chain's going to break when you pull too hard. Inflammation is the pull on the chain. Gotcha. So whatever triggers inflammation in your body, foods, environmental exposures, uh, toxins, heavy metals, emotional stress, and too many stress hormones in your body, whatever fuels inflammation is pulling on the chain. And when the chain breaks, when that link breaks, that's when your immune system starts attacking your own cells, your own body. It may attack your heart or it may attack your brain. And no one feels it when they've got elevated antibodies to their brain. You don't feel it until you've killed off enough cells that it becomes obvious that, oh, I'm getting old. I don't remember the way I used to. Ha ha. Oh, really? How old are you? Well, I'm 42. N no, that's not supposed to happen. No, there are scientists in their 80s that are learning new information. When I interviewed Professor Michael Marsh at Oxford University in England, um, he retired from being a gastroenterologist for 30 or 40 years, however long he was. And in his 60s, he went back to Oxford and he got two PhDs in the next 15 <laughs> years at Oxford. So, you know, our brains are designed to function with us for a long and vibrant life. It's only when you keep killing off brain cells then you kill off enough cells, now you start getting some symptoms and they get worse as you get older. The symptoms uh, progress faster and now you get a diagnosis of Parkinson's as if it happened last week. No, it's been happening for 20 or 30 or 40 years hmm. that you've been killing off your brain cells. So in your book, you, you just went over it a little bit, but in your book you said there are three things that are necessary for the development of autoimmune disease. What are they and what can we do about them? Sure, that's a really great question because, once again, this is the number one mechanism in getting sick and dying in the world. It's number one. And that means how many people does it uh, impact? Almost everyone. Mm, on some if, level, sure. Uh, on some level. Uh, so if you get cardiovascular disease, it's autoimmune in its initiating phases. If you get cancer, it's autoimmune in its initiating phases. If you get MS, it's autoimmune in its initiating phases. So this underlying mechanism, if people understand this underlying mechanism that's behind all diseases, all diseases, Wherever the weak link is, is where it's going to manifest. But if you understand this mechanism and you identify the mechanism in your body, where you are on the scale, then it gives you that window of opportunity to do something about it. So uh, what is the trilogy in the development of autoimmune disease? Uh, it was Professor Alessio Fasano at Harvard that first published on this back in 2005, so 11 years ago. And since then, there have been many, many research papers that have talked about this. The trilogy in the development of autoimmune disease. First, it's the genes. You can't do anything about that. You got the genes, you got the genes. It's the deck of cards that you were dealt in life. It doesn't mean that you're going to get the problem. It just means that's a little weaker link in your chain. Mm -hmm. The second is environmental triggers that are pulling on the chain. What are environmental triggers? Food sensitivities. Heavy metal poisoning from eating too much tuna, so you've got mercury poisoning, or lead poisoning, uh, toxic chemicals like one called bisphenol A that softens water bottles, the plastic in water bottles, it makes the plastic softer. Well, that stuff leaches out into the water and you drink the water. Or the uh, plastic lids 
uh, and for coffee shops like Starbucks and other coffee shops, the plastic lids are loaded with bisphenol A. You put that lid on your hot coffee, the steam from the hot coffee uh, rises and it condenses on the underside of the lid and then it drips back down into the coffee with bisphenol A. And then you drink the coffee, you're getting bisphenol A. So those are all environmental triggers. So the first one was a gene. Mm -hmm. The second one's the environmental trigger. And the third one is pathogenic intestinal permeability. The slang term is the leaky gut. To say is that you can arrest, and that's their language, arrest the development of autoimmune disease by healing the gut. So it comes down to how do I heal the gut? Well, first you have to identify how damaged is it and what type of damage is there and then how do I heal from that damage the first thing you do in healing from the damage is stop throwing gasoline on the fire I mean that just makes sense you can't have inflammation in your gut if you want to heal the gut absolutely so you do a test to find out what kind of damage is there and you say oh my gosh I have this oh my gosh yes you do that's okay we're gonna fix it it'll be fine it'll be fine but then you can't keep throwing gasoline on the fire expecting to put the fire out with a garden hose, but now and but you then you have a fire hose of gasoline going in there. You know, you just can't do that. Sure. Gotcha. Perfect. So let's talk about what foods impact us and what we should avoid and what foods should we eat to actually help assist healing that leaky gut, Tom. That's really a good question. So let's go back to um, what the leaky gut is first, and then uh, we'll go into what foods. Sure. So, um, Mrs. Patient, your intestines are a tube. The tube is 20, 25 feet long. It winds around inside your gut there, kind of twists and turns around. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. They're called microvilli. This shag is where calcium is absorbed. This shag, vitamin C. Over here are the shags our B vitamins over here, magnesium, all the shags absorb different nutrients. The shags have a cheesecloth covering them so that when food comes into the small intestine out of the stomach, sometimes, you know, some foods are easier to digest than others. So the foods that are easy to digest, they get broken down pretty quickly and they go right through the cheesecloth in the first part of the intestines and go into the bloodstream. The foods that are tougher to digest and take longer, those pieces of food can't get through the cheesecloth, and they have to go further down the tube, being um, uh, bathed in these digestive juices, breaking them down, breaking them down, breaking them down, until they break down really, really small, small enough to fit through the cheesecloth. That's how we absorb our nutrients. If you think of a protein, a protein is like a pearl necklace. Hydrochloric acid undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. And our digestive enzymes cut off, they're scissors that act, that cut off each pearl of the pearl necklace. Each pearl of the pearl necklace. Mm. So, the problem is, you know, these foods get broken down at different times. Some are very quickly, some are slower. So the ones that are quickly, they get broken down small enough to fit through the cheesecloth right away, as soon as they get into the intestines. That's great. The ones that are bigger, still bigger pieces, they've got to go further down. They can't fit through the cheesecloth yet. The problem, when you have intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, you tear the cheesecloth. And when you tear the cheesecloth, now these larger pieces of food that haven't had enough time to be broken down small enough yet to get through the cheesecloth, they're still big clumps of food, they get through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. Hmm. They're called macromolecules, big molecules. When they go through the bloodstream or through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream, your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I can't use this molecule as a building block to build a new muscle cell or a bone cell or a brain cell. I better fight this. Immune system, fight this. And then the immune system makes antibodies to fight that big clump of food. 
Now, if that big clump of food was a tomato, now you're making antibodies to tomatoes. Or if the big clump of food was chicken, now you're making antibodies to chicken. And there's nothing wrong with chicken for you, but you're, you're making antibodies to chicken. So you do a blood test, 90 food blood panel, and it comes back and you're allergic to 15 or 20 foods. And you say, oh my God, that's everything I eat. <laughs> well, of course it is. It's, it's your immune system trying to protect you because you've got these tears in your cheesecloth and these big molecules are getting into the bloodstream before they've been broken down small enough to fit through the normal cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. Get those foods out of your diet, heal your gut, and in six months to a year, you go back and check again, and now and instead of 15 to 20 foods you're sensitive to, now you're sensitive to two, and those are the ones you stay away from. I, I love that. So that actually proves what you're saying in that we can actually heal ourselves if we heal that leaky gut. That is exactly right. You can arrest the development of autoimmune diseases. What that means is you put them in remission when you heal the gut. Now, this is a really good point to bring this up. I just came up with this last week and I gave myself a high five, you know, when I did. It was kind of a cute moment. <laughs> oh, high five. I looked up one hand and the other hand hit it. You know, <laughs> there's a difference. Um, everybody wants a cure. Right. When you're, when you're sick and you go to a doctor, you want a cure. What drug is going to cure this for mm -hmm. me? There is no drug that's going to give you a cure for anything. Anything. Because when you have a cure, you think, well, the symptoms are all gone. The markers that there is a problem all come back to normal. So the markers are gone. And then you go on living your life the way you always have. That's a cure. But now we know that doesn't happen because it's lifestyle that causes the degenerative diseases. So you can't go back to living the lifestyle doing whatever you want the way you were before. Remission is when the symptoms are all gone. The biomarkers, the blood tests and things, they're all back to normal. And you've changed your lifestyle and you're living the new lifestyle and you feel like a million bucks. That's remission. Remission is available for everyone. Cures are not available for anyone. Brilliant. High five to you. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. That's, that's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's pretty profound. It is. It talk. actually is. Yeah. It actually is. That's brilliant. Um, you just talked about lifestyle. What lifestyle habits can somebody create or develop to help combat inflammation in their body, Tom? It's a really good point. Um, the first one that comes up, and I come from a blue collar background. You know, my dad was a firefighter and uh, always worked two jobs in his life, sometimes three. And so sometimes I'll, I'll regress back to the language of my dad. And so the first thing you do, at least it came up here to say this, is stop watching the idiot box at night. <laughs> <laughs> they called it the idiot box for the television. That we, we sit in front of the television for two, three, four hours a night. We watch the late night news about all the murders and the deaths in the world. And then we think we're supposed to go to sleep and have restful, peaceful sleep. Hmm. Right? So it would be much better in the evening after dinner, go for a walk. Just go for a walk. Let your body kind of calm down. You know, when the, when the lights, when the sun goes down and the light changes, the light goes down, that sends a message into the pineal gland through the eyes, right back into the brain that says, okay, and the pineal gland starts making hormones called melatonin. And what melatonin does say, okay, liver, time to go to sleep now. Okay, spleen, night, night. Okay, everybody, let's just calm down here. Lights out in 10 minutes, right? And so that's what melatonin does in our body. And that's triggered by the sun going down and the change of the light in the, um, the, in the world we're living in. Because we all live inside, we don't live out doors anymore. We don't have that because all the lights are on in the house and it's nice and bright and all that kind of thing. So when you go for a walk at night after dinner, as the lights are going down, you know, it's twilight and you're, you're sending messages to your brain that says time to calm down now, time to go to sleep. So that's the first thing is more restful sleep and mm -hmm. not sleep that two, three hours a night you're watching television. Take one hour with your spouse or your family. Go for a walk. 
and then go to sleep earlier. Get a couple extra hours of sleep in there. It might take a couple of weeks, but you'll find yourself waking up at the same time in the morning, even though you're going to bed earlier, and you're getting more sleep, and you feel refreshed, and you're ready to go after your day. So that's the first thing. The first thing is more sleep. The second thing to reduce inflammation, and it's outlined in the book uh, really well, and that is um, avoid uh, the foods that cause inflammation. Well, the three foods that we recommend people start with, because they are so very common to cause inflammation, are wheat, dairy, and sugar. Now, there are many more that may be a problem, like eggs or peanuts or soy, uh, there are corn, there are many other foods that can be a problem, but the three to start with, we find that helps uh, the vast majority of people is wheat, dairy, and sugar. Get those out of there completely. Let me say that differently. Get those out of there completely. <laughs> well, hold on, I'm going to say it differently. Get those out of there completely because you can't have a little. You have a little and you keep the inflammation going for at least three weeks from having a single exposure to a food that you're sensitive to. So get them out of there completely and just notice how you feel. Drink water, good clean water. Two big glasses first thing in the morning. First thing, people get up, go to the bathroom. After that, go get two big glasses of water before anything else. And the people that have done that for three, four, five days, they find that they're looking forward to, to their glasses of water when they get up in the morning because they just feel hydrated. They feel more ready to go. So those are a few pearls. Uh, get the allergenic foods out. Uh, get enough sleep. Get enough water. Uh, eat foods that are high in healing capacity. Foods like that are the berries, the berry family. That's um, uh, not Chuck Berry, but rather <laughs> blueberries, red raspberries, black raspberries, blackberries. Um, they're really good for you to have a little every day. One cup of blueberries a day, one cup a day over three years reverses cognitive decline, that's brain function, of up to 11 years. Wow. So one cup a day of blueberries for three years, and you're thinking the way you were 11 years earlier. Amazing. And I, and I use organic blueberries frozen. I've always got three or four packs in my freezer, so I can have a little blueberries at night. I love it. I love it. So our audience, what we try to bring to our audience, Tom, are little nuggets that help them, uh, tips, let's call them. If, if you could share one thing with a person on how to improve their health, what would it be? If there were only one, it would be fix your microbiome. Okay. Get, the, get the healthiest microbiome. That, that's um, that's um, all the bugs in your gut all the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, all of that that's in your gut. For those of you that have not heard this, there are 10 times more cells of the good bacteria in our gut uh, than all the cells in your body put together. All yeah. the heart cells, brain cells, skin cells, muscle cells, add them all up, it's not as much as the bacteria in your gut. So that's the first thing is... Uh, Rebuild the microbiome. Get a healthier microbiome. That is a critical, critical component. So we, what you're saying is we got to get the bad stuff out, the bad bugs out, replenish them with the good stuff. That's, that is brilliant, and I love that. And your analogy is such a great visual. The difference between a Berber carpet and a shag carpet. I think really hits home. It hit home for me, and when I present at lectures, and we, we lecture all the time in our office, we bring this exact analogy up, and you're the first person that I heard it from. So I think that's oh, brilliant. You. Yeah, I think thank that's you. brilliant, and your description of it in our talk today really hit home uh, brilliantly for me. Marvelous, marvelous. So let's let's just talk about where people can find your book sure um, and uh, uh, you know this thing about the book and this is my first book this is 30 years of my professional life and the stories that my mentors taught me and you know I'll tell you one story that's in there it's a pretty funny story uh, 
uh, my da- our daughter was, oh, I don't know, maybe six months old. So this was 1981. And uh, I'm at work, and my wife calls and says, Kelly's sick. What do you mean sick? <laughs> well, she's got a 106 fever. Did you call the pediatrician? Yes, and he's at the opera, but I left a message. He's supposed to call back. Okay. So I immediately came home, uh, rescheduled the rest of the patients for the day, immediately went home, and there's my daughter, limp, kind of, you know, I pick her up, and she's just like dead weight on the shoulder um, and burning up, 106. And uh, so I'm walking with her, patting her on the back. I don't know why. I think it made me feel better to pat her <laughs> on the back. I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, she was just almost lifeless, uh, kind of whining a little bit, but you know, just lifeless. And my wife had turned off dinner. She had made spaghetti, uh, but it's just on the stove getting cold now. And so I'm walking around holding my daughter saying, where's that doctor? Where's that damn doctor? And then I stopped in my tracks and said, wait a minute, I'm a doctor. <laughs> what, what would I do? And I had just come back from a seminar, and so I did the spleen pump technique, and it's written up in the book. And so I pumped her spleen and uh, picked her up again, and that was for about three to five minutes. He pumped the spleen, and I, that was about three to five minutes. And then uh, we're, I'm walking with her, and I'm walking with her, and walking through the kitchen. All of a sudden, she dives for the spaghetti, you know, and I held on to her. But and I, we just I looked at my wife, and you know, and she's eating the spaghetti out of her hand because she was hungry. And we took her temperature it was 99.5. Yeah. So it went from 106 to 99.5 in maybe five minutes. Wow. And I'd never heard of anything like that, but I've been telling patients about it now for 30 years. And they published a paper in 1952 where they went to a hospital and they took people's blood and they measured how many white blood cells they had. And then they pumped their spleens for three to five minutes and they drew the blood again and measured how many white blood cells they had. And consistently, they had 30% increase in white blood cells in 30 to 5 minutes, in 3 to 5 minutes, when they pumped the spleen. <laughs> now, what is that? Why does that happen? Well, the spleen is a reservoir that holds extra blood. And so what you're doing when you pump the spleen is you're kind of giving them a kick in the pants. Say, come on, guys, get out there and go to work. Go to work. And so they knock out the fever in, oh gosh, I didn't time it, but five minutes, maybe, maybe 10, I don't know. But it knocked out 106 fever. And our patients have had similar responses when they've implemented it at home themselves many, many times. So that's the book. I mean, the book is those kinds of pearls with um, this whole big picture of the number one cause of getting sick and dying. And what is it? It's autoimmunity. How does it happen? The trilogy. And what do I do about it? And we talk about what you do. How do you test for it? How do you identify it early? Uh, before there's so much tissue damage, you've got permanent damage. Sure. And then what do you do about it? So okay. that's that's all in the book, The Autoimmune Fix. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And right now, it's uh, 40% off at Amazon uh, in the pre-publication. Uh, the publication comes out, I think, September 12th. So if anyone orders it now, I think it's 16 bucks, uh, and they'll, they'll get it in about four to six weeks, you know, when the shipping date is there. But one of the benefits, and I'll just tell your audience this. Sure. One of the, uh, benefits of getting it now is that you save 16 bucks, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, the pre-sales apparently help determine the position of the book on the New York Times bestseller list. And if you, if an author gets to be a New York Times bestseller, the doors open so much easier to get on talk shows and talk about your book and things like that. And I want the whole world to know about this concept. Um, There are hundreds and hundreds of studies, and we've got about 300 studies referenced in the book, uh, but doctors don't know this and they don't think about this. When you walk them through the information, it makes perfect sense, but they just haven't thought about it. And I don't know why, but they haven't. And I want the whole world thinking about this. This is the number one cause of getting sick and dying. So the more people that understand this, at least at the basic level, and they go to their doctors and say, hey, doc, can you use a predictive antibody test to tell me where 
the weak link in my chain is and what autoimmune mechanism I might be coming down with, they'll go, what? <laughs> Have you been on the Internet again? <laughs> right? No, no, I read this book, and it makes perfect sense, and here's the book, and here's the studies um, on which the book is based. And But I want that kind of discussion to start because the problem here, uh, the real problem, uh, Dr. Michael, is that for the first time in the history of the human species, for the very first time, the New England Journal of Medicine tells us that children born today have a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. They're going to get sick earlier, get diagnosed with disease earlier, and die earlier than their parents. That scary we're, stuff. We're killing ourselves off, and it's very scary stuff. And We don't know what to do about it, so we do nothing. I'm telling you, Read the book. It'll make perfect sense to you. And then we can start having discussions with our doctors, which will get the doctors to make more demands on the laboratories to make new tests. And when the laboratories make new tests, more doctors will do those tests. So it's a trickle-up effect. It's like going upstream to cause a flood. And that's what I'm hoping your readers will do is help us get the word out about this fantastic and if people buy pre-sale you you do a really nice job there's a bonus for folks as well yes there is there's a few bonuses in there um I'm, and i quite uh, apologetically don't know what they all are i'm supposed to and i'm just not <laughs> a marketing guy i don't know i don't know uh but there's a few of them i know i know the article's in there the conundrum of gluten sensitivity why the tests are often wrong and it explains to you why the common tests that are done looking for food sensitivities are not complete. They're accurate, but they don't check thoroughly enough. And so that's all explained. Um, I think the best of the gluten summit is in there. Yep. That's a number of interviews that were done uh, that I did with world scientists uh, for the gluten summit. Um, then there's one, now that you know, where do you go? And awesome. It's an audio file. So now that you've gotten the diagnosis, okay, you have an autoimmune disease, where do you go? Well, here's the tests that you might consider doing uh, that can tell you on the checklist, is it this, is it this, is it this? You go through the checklist from the priorities, most important to least important. And so that article is in there also. Sweet. Uh, the one last thing, and I promise, Tom, the last thing is because you slipped this one in there under the radar. Can you tell people about the trail? Ah, thank you. I did the Gluten Summit two and a half years ago, and 118,000 people watched it at the time. Now over 200,000 people have watched it, and it changed a lot of lives. You know, I go through airports, and when I go through the TSA thing, I'm on the other side getting my bag. This happened just last week again, and someone walks up to me and says, Excuse me, are you Dr. O'Brien? <laughs> and I said, Yes. And sometimes, like last week, they start crying. They just start crying. And they say, you, you saved our daughter's life. And uh, they listened to the summit. They decided to try this thing about what's on your fork causes fire or doesn't. And they reversed their daughter's juvenile arthritis. And she's off all of her medications and she can walk. Or someone else will say, we put my multiple sclerosis into complete remission and the lesions on the brain are gone. Uh, or someone else will say, my migraines were gone in three days and I've lived with them for years. I mean, these dramatic stories, time after time after time. And you know, I'm, uh, I used to be really awkward and uncomfortable with this. You know, I said, oh, that's great. Thank you. You know, I didn't know what to say, but now I know that if I just give that person 30 seconds or a minute, you know, let them tell me their story, it validates their story for them. And it helps keep them on track, you know, that they're getting healthier and they put their disease into remission. So the acknowledgments and just the love that comes through people's eyes has been so overwhelming. You know, I've known for a while, I got to do something else. I got to do something else, and I just, I've just i been waiting, and then it came to me last October. Well, of course, gluten is a primary gasoline on the fire, but 
the disease that happens. What's the disease? Oh, it's autoimmune. Of course it's autoimmune. That's the number one mechanism. Let's talk to the scientists about autoimmunity. And so I traveled the world. And I've got 78 scientists that I've interviewed in London and Brisbane and uh, uh, Lisbon and Girona and Barcelona and Madrid and uh, Sao Paulo and Leipzig, Germany. Uh, I've interviewed all these scientists about autoimmunity and we put it together and it's coming out in November and it's called Betrayal. Because your immune system is supposed to be protecting you. Why is it betraying you? If autoimmunity is the number one cause of getting sick and dying, why is it betraying you? And what you will learn is that it's not betraying you. It's really protecting you. It's the macromolecules that come in through the tears in the cheesecloth and, and cause the, the thyroid autoimmune disease or the brain autoimmune disease. So you have to heal the gut. That's one kind of concept that you'll learn about. But it's the bisphenol A that's uh, the chemical in uh, that softens water bottles, and of course it gets in the water when you leave your car your your um, water bottle in the car, uh, mm. and, and the water heats up. The bisphenol A gets in there. It's in the it's loaded in the caps in the lids in coffee cups. So you you go to Starbucks and you get a coffee, and you. Uh, the heat from the coffee, the steam rises to the underside of the lid. It condenses on the underside of the lid and then drips back down into the coffee loaded with bisphenol A. Or the chlorine that's in our water that you don't need the chlorine that's in the water. Uh, you can put a chlorine filter on easily on your kitchen sink. But the chlorine kills the good bacteria in the gut, in our microbiome, so then you fall prey to getting more bad bacteria and more infections in your gut that then affect your brain, and now you have you have depression. But it came from the bad the disruption of the bacteria in the gut. They came from con contributed to by the chlorine in the water. So you listen to these scientists, and they just walk us back upstream. You know, like you fall in the stream and you go downstream and you go over the waterfall. Well, you go back back upstream. And you see where does all this come from? So betrayal will be coming out in November. And it's all these kinds of what that you hear again and again and again from these scientists who've spent their life studying this stuff. And I keep reminding people when I'm on stage and also in betrayal, I say, you have to remember, these scientists are geeks. They are not English majors. They're geeks. So when they talk, they talk geek. Right? <laughs> yeah. But but I'm there saying, now wait, excuse me, Professor, did you just say yes? Does that mean yes? Do you hear that, people? And so I'm interpreting it for you. So I, I try to put it in everyday language so that we all can understand what these world-class scientists, I'm so proud of the people that I've interviewed. All this is coming out in November, and it's called Betrayal. Awesome. Tom, thanks so much for being on the show today. It is honestly my pleasure to talk to you, and I could talk to you all day. Uh, love having you on the show. We are um, committed to helping you get the word out as you've supported our projects in the past. And you were actually my first interview I ever did, and I was shaking like a leaf, and you're like, Michael, Take a breath. Right. <laughs> right. Chill out, man. It's going to be fine. Let's just have fun with. It. Let's just let's just try to share this information with the world. Exactly. And, and, and you've done so much since then, Michael. <laughs> High five you, my friend. High five myself. There we go. Thanks, Tom. Go. <laughs> Good for you. Um, folks, everything that we talked about will be in the show notes so that you could. Absolutely check out Tom's book. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go to Amazon. Uh, you can go to his website, thedoctor.com uh, forward slash book. Um, anywhere that you could get that book, I would greatly appreciate you checking it out. Um, if you like today's show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. The more people we get this out to, the more prevalent this information becomes and the healthier we become as a society and a world. Michael, may I say something about Shh. that? Or oh, absolutely. 
we are such a complacent society, we just sit on our backsides and just let life go by so often. How many of us have written a note to our representative to say, you need to do something to clean up the environment? Or how many of us have written a note to say, you know, there's something going on here with this thing about uh, chemicals in our food chain or the overuse of antibiotics or GMO. Um, how many of us do the little things like, you know, it takes you like two minutes. So what Michael is asking, it takes two minutes to go to Apple, to the iTunes and say, well, wow, thanks very much. That show is great. I learned a little bit. Really appreciate it. Look forward to more. It takes you two minutes to give back for all of the energy that Michael and all of us put to give out to you. So excuse me for being direct, but get off the backside and just give a little back. You know, I, I, the, um, that movie has always stuck with me, uh, pay, pay It Forward. Mm. It's always stuck with me. You know, do something nice just for the sake of doing something nice, and it's always going to come back to you, you know. So, Michael, you're doing great work, and so thanks very much for the opportunity to be on the show. Thanks again, Tom. Great talking to you. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Take care. Ciao.